Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Facebook Ads Kingdom podcast. We tackle some of the biggest questions surrounding Facebook ads, e-commerce businesses, and entrepreneurship products, and so much more. What, what's I happening? I don't swear. What? <laughs> what's happening? It's a jingle. Right now? Yeah. Well, I'm doing a jingle. <laughs> Thought I'd change it up a bit. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host, Morty Rapp, and with me is my co-host and my boss is Real Rats, the founder of Rats Pack Media. And welcome back to the show. Today, we are going to talk about CPA. What does CPA stand for? Cost per acquisition. Whoa. We want to pay as little to Facebook as possible. Even though we're working in the Facebook space, we want, it, we want every single acquisition to be as low as possible. So the question is... How do we do it? How do we lower that thing, baby? Let's jump right in. I got a question for you, Israel. Are you Absolutely. ready? Hold on Always. to your knickers. Are you holding on to them? I actually took my knickers off <laughs> before the show. <laughs> I am knickerless right now. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't. I apologize for that. It's, it's, <laughs> things get inappropriate very fast here, even though we don't swear. Here's the question. How do we give us like the easiest definition of CPA within the world of meta? Okay, so every time, let's say this, every time you want to spend money anywhere on the internet or off the internet, you want to be asking, what do I want this money to do? Uh, you know, there was um, an old school episode of Shark Tank years ago where Kevin O'Leary said that he views his money as army soldiers and he wants to, send, he wants to put all his dollars out on the battlefield and then he wants them to go and collect more dollars. So at the end of the day, his dollar soldiers come back with more dollar soldiers. It's really stuck with me. I'm not sure if you saw that episode. I have no idea which company it was. Um, it was like a very, very early episode of Shark Tank. And it really stuck with me. Like that's what you want. You want your, you want your, your ad spend to go out every day and spend the money and then come back with more money to spend for tomorrow so that your army gets bigger and bigger. So the goal, step number one, is to understand why you're spending money at all in your business. So it might not always be direct correlation between dollar spend and receive money. Sometimes you want a lead for a webinar. Sometimes you want an app install on your new app that you've got. Sometimes you want to hire a new person and that has nothing to do with, you know, the direct connection between a purchase. Maybe it's to save money. Maybe you want to hire someone that will keep users from re asking for a refund or keeping their product or, you know, whatever that looks like instead of returning to exchange. So the first step is to understand why am I at spending money at all in my business? Then once I have the reason behind it, now the, the A in CPA becomes whatever the thing is. Is it a lead? Is it an app install? Is it a purchase? Is it a video view? So, so the first thing you want to define is um, what is it that I want to get? And then the second thing you want to define is what is it worth me paying money for it? So that's what I want to know is, is it worth me paying money to get this acquisition? And then based on the cost, maybe it is or isn't worth it. For example, we spoke a lot about this baby clothing brand that I worked with and they sell products that range between the price of about $5 to about $30. If a person comes and buys just one product, let's just say they're making $11. If your CPA is $28, it's not really worth it for you to pay to receive $11. But if you are able to get that user to buy a larger basket of goods and they'll buy $75 worth of product, then it all of a sudden becomes worth it to pay $35, $40 with your profit margins for that product. So that's basically to me, the three stages is mm -hmm. one, what do I want my money to do? That's my goal, my acquisition goal. Two, how do I find out the price to get the user to do it? And then three, am I making profit on that transaction? of the user pay like me paying whatever platform that is and the user paying me in the end of the day and this is true even if it requires 37 steps like even if you're a business coach and the first thing you want to do is collect a user to join your email list and then from the email list you're going to send them to a, an email series and then from the email series there's going to be a webinar and from the webinar there's going to be a sales page from the sales page there's going to be 
an actual purchase to make. So now you have to look at the entire series mm. of events, the entire funnel. And you know, at the end of the funnel, I'm going to make five, ten thousand $10,000, whatever that number is. Right. But is it worth it? Is the CPA of a lead worth it for me on stage number two right. to pay $87 per lead? And you would actually calculate every single one of those steps as one giant thing. And that would be the total CPA of the, of, of the Correct. client. Correct. Of, of the client. That's the value of the client overall. Well, it's the cost, of, they're the gonna cost buy. of the client, meaning they have to right, go through right. the nine How steps and it costs cost you money in each step. One. And then do I actually make a profit at the end when the user buys that, when you know some percentage of the users buy that product all the way at the end of the buying journey? And we even know from one of the prospects we were going after, you remember, he was, he was acquiring at a loss. He was acquiring leads as a, at a loss. Yeah, and that was his... That was his mentality. He was doing it on purpose. It was so shocking. So, so the answer is that there is, there exists to me really only one reason to collect, well, two, two reasons to collect users at a loss. Reason number one is I believe that in the lifetime of the user, I'm going to be able to sell them some much bigger thing, but it's going to take me like, really far down the road. Like right now I have a thing for three, $400, but it's coming a time when I'm going to sell an item for $5,000 and all those leads that I'm buying at a loss are going to eventually be worth it. I'm going to add a third mm. one. The second one is what I've heard be defined as the wow factor, right? So let's say you have a newsletter and your newsletter doesn't really make you much money now, right. but you're collecting emails to join your email newsletter. And you know that an advertiser will much likely, much more likely pay for an email newsletter that has 3 million users than one that has 35 users, right? So there's, there's exists this number that, that, that causes this wow factor from advertisers. Uh, the bigger that number is, the more they're willing to pay. So today the user's value on the email newsletter is probably relatively low, you know, one of 47 emails. When you're advertising to them, you're probably not make like the advertisers not really making much money from it, unless like those are like the super highest quality users in the whole wide world. Um, but all of a sudden, when you have thirty seven thousand people, now it becomes worthwhile for you to advertise. So like just that wow factor of so like size of list becomes valuable. The third one is if you have potential investors, and so now the point of you growing the list has nothing to do with the profit has nothing to do with, you know, the number of users, it just has to do with, I need to prove to these investors that I have something valuable. And to do that, I have to show them I'm actively growing every month, even if it means right. that I'm losing money. So there exists an entire world that I'm not much part of, that businesses will actively pay at a loss for users. Uh -huh. Uber Eats, uh, right. DoorDash, right? All of these sure. companies are actively losing money for each user because they need to prove to their investors and the public market that they can keep growing users every single month because the day that, that was they the WeWork users, story, right? Like that was the WeWork story. They were yeah. they were hemorrhaging money every second. So so I don't I don't think DoorDash has ever made a profit, if I remember correctly. They've never made a profit, but they exist at least until now just for the sake of showing investors, potential investors, that they, they will one day be this very variable company. So they, to prove that they have to keep getting new monthly users. So they're literally getting a user at a loss. Wow. The same thing happened with Casper mattresses, right? right. Casper mattresses wanted to go public and then it came out like they had to spend something like $900 more than the cost of the mattress to physically give away a mattress to a user like that. It cost them so much money that they were losing a mattress and $900 Jeez. for every purchase of a mattress just for the sake of, you know, growing. So to me, if that's your business model, your business model is get money from investors and then show your investors how great you are by raising another round and making them some money, then that's a reason. Like it's a, is it, is it, a great reason, probably not. It's a legitimate reason why I would spend more money um, for a user than how much I make from that user. Well, let's let's pivot now into uh, what what we really want to talk about is, and at the end of the day, people really 
what they want to do is they still they want to acquire a customer at the lowest cost. So what are the factors that would influence the cost of acquisition? Sure. So the first one, which is like a hot topic amongst ad buyers, is how much you're physically paying a CPM cost per impression. Now, M doesn't stand for impression, but it's some like it's some like Latin word that means a thousand people. So CPM is how much it costs you to reach a thousand people. And so in any platform that you spend money on, whether that's Google, TikTok, Snapchat, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Facebook, doesn't matter. You get a number in your back end that shows how much money you are paying for that impression. And so you want to know how many people can I reach for X dollar price? So obviously if there's work you could do to lower your CPM, that's a thing you should do. So your CPM cost is the first number that you can see from almost every platform to then influence you. Should I, should I not? Could, can I do anything to lower this price? That's number one. Number two is CPC, which is cost per click. Now this number is directly correlated to your CPM. And so there's a number that is actually the fusion of those two numbers, which is called CTR cost, sorry, click through rate, which is the number of people that click from your ad that see your ad. So the higher that number is, the lower your CPC will be. Because if I'm paying this, this let, let's just say, I'm paying a flat cost of $20 CPM for a thousand users, which is high for some and low for others. So we're just gonna throw out that number, $20 CPM. Now, if I have a click-through rate of 1%, I'm gonna pay a certain amount for that click because 1% of the users are buying. If I'm, I have a 5% click-through rate, I'm paying one fifth the price than I would if I was, if I had that, that 1% click through rate. So whatever you can do to get that user from the ad to actually click onto the landing page, that is going to decrease your cost, your CPM cost. And then the third and final metric is your conversion rate on the site. So those are the three levers. It's getting the impression in front of the user. I didn't actually explain the thermal, but we'll get to it in a second. Getting, getting the, the impression in front of the user, getting the user to engage and click from the ad, and getting the user from the landing page to actually make the purchase. Those are right. the three stages that, that now you have those three pieces of data tell you your CPA. Because if I could, let's just say a number, if I get in front of a thousand people and from the thousand, 10 click, that's 1% of a thousand. And then from the 10, one purchase, that's a 10% conversion rate on my landing page. So now I know how much, how many people I have to send. So for every sure. thousand users, 10 users click, for every 10 users, one user buys. That's my, and that defines my, my impression cost. Well, it doesn't define my impression cost, but I have an impression cost. I have my click-through rate. I have my conversion rate and from there, I now have a price that it costs me to buy, to, to get that user to buy. So from here, my three levers are, can I lower my CPM? Can I lower or increase my CTR or lower my CPC? And can I increase my conversion rate? Those are the three things I wanna to do to get my costs per acquisition as low as possible. So that, now let's talk about each one, meaning what influences how, how much an impression costs? Is it a trending topic? Is it you have the best socials on planet Earth? Is it just that Facebook likes your product more than another product? Like what is going to make something more expensive or cheaper for the impressions? Yes. So first we're going to say that we're sp talking specifically about Facebook. Other platforms work other ways. For example, Google, you do not pay by impression. You pay by click. That's why Google is actually a PPC platform, pay per click platform. Facebook is not a pay per click platform. There is a way to specifically request Facebook to only charge by click, but 99% of ad spend across all ad buyers does not run your Facebook ads that way. And so a typical ad, you're gonna pay per impression. So now we're talking specifically about Facebook. What are the levers that we can control that allow us to decrease or increase our CPM? So if you choose a, a demographic, a user demographic, Facebook already knows how many other advertisers there are that 
are actively trying to target that group of people. You could imagine there's some areas, for example, Las Vegas and New York City are the two most heavily targeted areas in the whole world for ad buying. And then specifically women age 35 to 55 are the highest targeted demographic in America. So the overlap of women, gender, age 35 to 55, location, New York or Las Vegas, they are the highest, most heavily targeted users on earth. So now if I were to go to some small town in some small European country, the amount of active advertisers in that location are dramatically lower than the number in middle of Manhattan targeting women 35 to 55. So just based on who I'm going to going after, the amount of competition is going to increase my cost. And a lot of times people see this in the business coaching world where you might be targeting a group of people, but you're paying five, 10 times, like I said, 20, $20 CPMs. If you're in the business world and, and having that number, that's an amazing, fantastic, unbelievably good number because you're competing against other people trying to reach the super targeted niche. And just the fact that you're trying to reach this group of people is costing you a lot more money than other types of people. That's number one is the person you're actively trying to target. Number two is the objective you're running the ads for. So within Facebook today, when you click to create a campaign, they give you like a series of, I don't know, five to seven options ranging from uh, awareness to video view, to link click, to uh, lead, app install and purchase, right? So six approximately, there might be one or two that I missed. And so based on the objective you choose on that stage, whether you're targeting this very same group of people or not, Facebook is going to charge you based on the the, pro, the type of objective you're after. And the idea behind that is when you target a group of people, so let's say we're still after that, women, Las Vegas, 35 to 55, demographic targeting. And we tell Facebook, we want video views. So within that group of people, let's just say there's a million, I don't know, a million people that fit that demographic, women, Las Vegas, 35 to 55. Within that group, some of them love watching video view, love watching videos. Some of them love, love downloading apps. Some of them love giving their email address to sign up to weird ebook things. I don't know. And so Facebook looks at this group of a million people and they say, who within this group is most likely going to achieve the request you have? And so the fact that I'm asking for a video view versus a purchase means that I'm going to pay for what is the lower quality user than if I'm running ads for purchases, for sales. So Within this, the very same targeting, I might pay $5 CPMs or $50 CPMs just by choosing a different objective, which is actually why I believe against most ad buyers that when running an ad towards cold audiences, you should never run an ad that's not either a lead, an app install or a purchase. And the reason is because what you're actively doing is telling Facebook, Target for me, the very worst people that love clicking on links, engaging with posts and watching videos. Right. And so what I want instead is I want to fill my bucket of warm users who I want to target later and get on my email list and get them to buy for me. I want to target the very best people. Who are those people? The people that Facebook looks at and says, Hey, these people, they buy, they sign up to newsletters. They engage with, you know, with the apps. These are the sort of people I want to talk to and pay for again and again when I'm running Facebook ads. So if I'm running an ad for a video view and targeting cold, totally cold audiences, Facebook's looking at it and going, see this million people? Well, here's like 70,000 of them that just love watching video views. They don't do anything else. Cause if they did, they wouldn't be here in the video view campaign. They'd be sitting in the sales That's campaign. That's right. That's right. And it's almost like the ad buyers that you, you, that you're mentioning. It's like they're playing a similar game with like the investors. Like I just want right. to hit a metric. It has right. nothing to do with making money or revenue or anything. It's just, oh, right, you want sure. more email? I could get you email subscribers. Right. And they're just like the worst. So from what I've seen, these are like the worst quality users. And all it does in the end is as you're running ads for engagement and clicks, you're drowning your good quality users with right. Millions of people. So now I'm going to rerun ads again, targeted my engage, engage users for some other type of ad, hopefully further down the funnel where they're actually potentially going to buy. 
and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell Facebook, target my engagers, except I just got 75,000 engagers that watched a video or liked the post or shared something or messaged me that are all totally irrelevant users because they are not the type of person that Facebook would target for sales. So, so, so again, this is a large factor when targeting, even with tar if just simply targeting within Facebook, that's going to dramatically affect your CPM. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to lower my CPM without actively lowering my quality, the quality of the users I'm getting. So if I'm going to run a link click and engagement or landing page or whatever ad, the only people I want to be talking to are the ones who are the very best users on my email list and add to cards, initiate checkout, stuff like that. Because at least I know if I'm reaching them and I might be paying a little bit of money, at least I know they're good quality users to begin with. So the, the chance right. of them buying is much higher. Okay, so that's number two for what influences the CPM. Number three that influences the CPM is the quality of my page, right? So if I have a really engaging Instagram or Facebook page, Facebook knows that information. They see, whoa, people love engaging and they love commenting on my posts. So because of that, I'm going to beat out a, po a page that doesn't have so much mm -hmm. engagement. So you're always better off. Am I going to say always? You're almost always better off running Facebook ads from a page that has an existing following, organic posts, people engaging with those posts, and so if you have a page that you've never posted, I see this quite often, like people, let's say they have a Facebook, they don't have an Instagram. So now they want to run fit as from an Instagram account. So they tell me like, well, I, I have a blank Instagram account. What should I do? I'm like, you got to start posting. Just take your organic post from Facebook and just start putting them three times a week just so there's something feeding the system that's teaching Instagram one way or the other, whether this post page is good or not. Right. Just, you know, put content on that page. Obviously not like totally unrelated content, put the content that, helped you grow on Facebook on your fa on your Instagram. And now I'm seeing the reverse people with Instagram accounts with no Facebook accounts that now right. like, what do I do with this? Who's even engaging? Uh, it doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is to put good content on there so that Facebook sees when I'm running an ad, my page is ranked high enough. Interestingly, within this umbrella of my page being ranked is, is Facebook um, surveys users every so often. So I don't know how often people use, TikTok, they do this. I see this a lot on TikTok where I'll be watching a video and I'll swipe up and it'll ask me like, did I like this video? What kind of content was this video? Did I find it engaging, entertaining, blah, blah, blah. And I mm. answer it in real time. That's teaching the algorithm if this page is one that Facebook should continue showing. So they actually do this. They find if users buy on, on within the Facebook platform they're purchasing. So Facebook's going to ask the user, did you like the product? Did it show up on time? Did, the, you know, did it show up as expected? And that rating actively affects your CPMs. I've actually seen it happen. I had a client years ago that was doing drop shipping. And when you do drop shipping, the product takes a real long time to ship, like six to eight weeks. So when you're expecting, when you live in an Amazon world where you get your product tomorrow and you order something, it comes nine weeks from now. And then Facebook asks, how did you enjoy this experience? The users are not so happy. They had a negative score when it came to the customer satisfaction. We saw a huge increase in CPM not having to do with the type of ad or who we're targeting or anything, just simply because of the way Facebook's grading the Facebook page in that right. moment. So that's number three is the page overall. And then number mm -hmm. four is the piece of content that I'm running for the ads. So the way I measure if it's a good post or not is just the CTR, which we already discussed, the click-through rate. Is the user act actively engaging with the post? Because if they're not engaging with the post, then it means that the user isn't interested. So Facebook looks at these posts. What they'll do is let's say, let's just say you have an ad with one, can, one ad set with 10 ads, right? So now Facebook has to choose which ad it wants to show users. So what it'll do it, it'll, it'll kind of like spend a couple of pennies across each ad and you'll see like 10 cents, eight cents, 11 cents, right? Very early on. And we'll do this initial test. It will show a handful of users. And then based on the engagement of which post does well, meaning it got a video view, it got a like engagement, whatever, it got a click that shows Facebook, oh, this is the one that's getting the engagement. Let's now push a large amount of money towards that ad, which, you know, sometimes could be great because that could be the best performer. Sometimes it could be terrible. So I had a client one time, they used an ad and it got like a negative comment one time from a user 
And then all the ad spend got funneled to this one post oh, God. <laughs> that had a negative comment because Facebook saw comment, right? Wow, let's put the money there. So like very early on in the campaigns, I, we do, you do tend to see this where Facebook sees, oh, there's a like, let me just put all the money into this one post that got this like, even though really it wasn't at all the best. And that's creative. happening <laughs> automatically? You have no control over that? Yeah, no, if you put ads in an ad set, you have no control over which ad gets spend. If you have multiple ad sets, you can then control, you know, which creative gets spend on it. But there is no way within the ad set level to choose which ad gets spend. So realistically, the goal that Facebook has is the, the post with the most engagement. So obviously the hope is that 80% of the time it's getting it right. But as the ad buyer, you need to be in there to make sure that's actually what's happening and not, you know, driving hundreds of dollars to a post that's not getting any sales but it's get, it got like three comments very early on from not happy users and right. uh, it's dragging all I the just spent out. a lot of money to get hate. Sweet. A lot of money to get hate. So, so that's basically like the, the things you can, the, thing, the overall picture of your CPM cost is yep. who you're targeting, the objective you're running the ads to, the quality score on your page and the quality of the ad itself. So now you're asking, so how do I change? How do I move the needle? Right. Right. So it's, well, it's, it's two things. It's how do I move the needle? And then also, how do I, how do I, what are, what are the active things I can do to, to make it lower and lower and lower? Right. Correct. Correct. So in the moment, in the moment of I'm looking at my CPMs, I want to get them lower. There's not much I could do as far as those four components. I can't actively help my page score today to get a dramatically better score and hope that that's going to lower my CPM. The only two things I control are who I'm targeting right. and the creative itself. That's it. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do when doing testing is to actually have a handful of different audiences. Right. So at, back in the old days of Facebook ads, before everyone was, you know, everyone was on board to just target broad and call it a day, which I'm still not, but back, back in a, day, a while ago, what I used to do is I used to take a handful of, I call them interest groups. So you imagine, let's just say, for example, you're trying to target entrepreneurs, right? So within the list of people that are entrepreneurs, they have multiple interests. It might be, you know, SaaS companies they use, like a Clavio, a MailChimp, a uh, Buffer, uh, whatever, uh, Triple Whale, something like that. The tool, the actual tool they're paying to use. It might be, or Shopify, right? If they're, if they're a, a, an e-commerce business. Number two is what podcasts they listen to. So you might be able to go and search for podcasts that they're listening to and create a bucket of interest based on the podcast. What about magazines they read, like Entrepreneur or Business Insider, stuff like that? What about books they read? You know, famous books. What about like famous other entrepreneurs like a Gary V or a Seth Godin or a Ted, T Tony Robbins or whatever, all those people. So now what you end, end up doing is you end up with a, a bunch of these buckets. Now, in theory, they overlap, right? It's, a, it's I'm all, I'm focused on, this group of people that is entrepreneurs. But what you might find is that targeting them in a, one of these ways actually mm. is a dramatically lower CPM. So in the end, I'm targeting, I'm, I'm after the same group of people. The people I want to buy from me fit this category of entrepreneur. But right. by testing different groups of interests, I'm able to find, wow, the one, the podcast one, that's really cheap. Wow, the book one, that's really cheap. But like magazines, insanely expensive. Like forget that. What you end up doing is you end up learning which interest groups work. And then I can go now with my lists and say, okay, I know, you know, groups A, B, C are great. Let me go find more interests. And you can just go searching more interests that fit that category. And you can run ads. And the problem is that within setting up ads, if you were to take all these buckets and put them together, Facebook won't tell you which interest is best. If I take a single ad set and I add one ad set with 57 ad um, audiences, like interest audiences, Facebook's not going to tell me number 11 was the best. Right. It's not going to tell you that information. It's going to tell you overall, we targeted the people we targeted and this is what we got. So in order for you to learn which ones work best, you want to do this thing where you're, you know, putting multiple buckets. Once right. you've gotten to the point where, you know, here are my buckets that work at that point, you can come back to Facebook and say, here, take all my 33 ad interests, put them all together. And now in theory, you potentially could get a slightly lower cost because you're you're allowing them you're not competing against each other which you're not really but facebook says you are that's fine um 
by c consolidating ad sets to one or two ad sets that are doing all these interest targeting, you've proved, you've done the step of testing, figured out which interests work, and then you can now go and put them all together to run an ad that in theory would do slightly better because you've consolidated the ad sets, which would lead to a lower overlap mm. in audiences. So, That's really so that cool. is one of the approaches to take to lower your CPM. The other one, the only other option is the lens, is, is the creative itself, right? Just, you have to make a better ad. And so now you want to do testing to find out what is the best creative. So I've seen this a lot. I'm actually like actively looking right now at a potential client and I'm seeing like they're running one ad per ad set. And I said, you know, what's happening here? Like you're, you're only allowing users to see just one version of your potential infinite number of versions of ads. So Facebook just recently rolled out a thing called flexible ads, which is still like early days for me to have a strong opinion on it. Right now, the big opinion among ad buyers is that flexible ads are not meant to teach you what works. It's meant to give customization to users. So mm -hmm. what currently is happening is you cannot see a breakdown of what's working in, within the flexible ad. You just get an overall cost. What Facebook allows you to do, much like what used to be called dynamic creative is now gone, is you can upload up to 10 creatives. So I can put in seven images and three videos or five videos and three, whatever it is, a mix of creative. Facebook's now going to, in real time, create an ad specific for the user choosing the creative it thinks is most relevant to the user. And you can put up to five versions of primary text, five versions of headline, five versions of description. And Facebook That's will cool. play around which, with which text to use for each user. So again, the purpose for Flexible is not a testing period to find which ads work best, then find the post that works the best and run that one on its own, which is what the purpose of Dynamic Creative was. Flexible is more focused around, I already have proven imagery. Let me use the proven imagery for Facebook to be more customizable to the user. So what I like to do is I like to be early on, be much more manual. And the suggestion on Facebook was to have about six creatives. And what that allows you to do is have video, carousel, images, two of each, that's six. So by having three creatives, one, two, sorry, three types of creatives, two carousels, two videos, and two images, I'm now able to test within Facebook. I'm targeting the very same users, right? In my ad set, I have a group of people and I'm targeting that group of people. The question now becomes which ad works best? Well, do these, like, do these users like car carousels? Do they like videos? Do they like images? And so by testing a handful, back a long time, I used to run like, you know, 50 versions of this. I don't think you need 50 right now, but like anywhere between six and 15 is like a pretty good number to test. And now I'm throwing, I'm giving Facebook, you know, stuff to use with end users. I'm going to let it spend, let's say three to $500. That allows the, the system to spend enough money to show it to different users. And from there, I'm able to see the breakdown of costs, the CPM costs, the click through rate cost, click, you know, the cost per impression uh, click on that ad. And this is the testing I could do to, to, to lower my CPM by having a more engaging post towards this group of people, the very same people, I haven't changed the people. I'm able to lower my CPM because it's like saying this, this group of people is a rel, sorry, this ad is relevant to these users. Look, they're clicking, they're liking, they're sharing, they're commenting, they're, you know, they're doing what they're supposed to, they're watching. So those are the two levers to pull when it comes to CPM today that I could affect that's going to, that could dramatically help me decrease my CPM costs. Nice. Right. So it's actually, you answered a bunch of my questions already because we, we spoke about segmentation, which is, can have a very big influence on, on the cost of the acquisition. We also spoke about the role of creative and how that influences the cost of acquisition. So let's talk about something else here now. Can you, well, we're can you in the middle of a bigger question still, which is well, the question all, was lowering. How do we lower? So, so, so all we've done so far is lowering your CPM, but there's still two more metrics to lower. Yeah. Right. Meaning the C, what the, the CPC, itself. Yeah. the CPC and the conversion rate on the page. So this, that was just the work to be done. All of the stuff we talked about was just the work to be done to lower your CPM. Right. So now at this point, we're getting ads in front of the users that are the, the, the cheapest, right. In hopes the, the lowest CPM. And we're getting the ad to in front of them. That is the most engaging ad. So from here, what can I do to actively influence the CPC? 
Right. Right. So in this moment, now again, CPC, Facebook is looking at your CPM cost and your click-through rate and all this stuff to, in, that is influencing your CPC. But in the moment, what can I do to increase my CPC? So really like, again, there's only two options. Like I've already done all this testing among my audience. I've already done this testing among my creative. What can I do? So in the moment, the thing to do really, number one is like, be more persuasive about why they're clicking. Like if this user is engaging, they're watching. They're, they're commenting and sharing. What is stopping them from actively clicking to get to the landing page? And sometimes it's just like a little nudge at the end of the video that says, click down below to learn more, which is why every YouTuber and podcaster that you've ever watched in history tells you to do that because sometimes it's all it takes. Like you just watch a five minute super engaging video and now you're like, okay, sign up, I'm out of here. But like, no, I want you to take an action. What's that action? Click down below to learn more, right? And so literally sometimes I literally suggest to you to to um, my clients, just add the words into the text, the primary text, click the link for more or click to buy, like just adding those words <laughs> and telling the user to take this action can dramatically increase your, C your, your click through rate and lower your CPC, right? Simple. The second one is to have a more engaging piece of content, right? Like, so now at this point, what you've done in CPM testing was finding which ads work. Just like I spoke about with the testing for audiences where you have these groups and now you find which group works best and you're able to say, great, group A, A, D and F work best. Let me now consolidate them all into one ad set and now I can run them because I know they're the ones that work best. Same exact thing now should happen within your, your testing. I now tested my 12, 15 versions of ads. Now I can go and say these three are working. Well, what about these three other things that's working? And now can I take those things and say, can I create three more just like this? And so that's what I'm going to do in the CPC testing, which is I right. now have creative that work. I now have audiences that work. Can I be more persuasive in the text? Can I make a more engaging, you know, this is where people like text, test a hundred hooks, hooks for their videos. What I wouldn't do is create 30 videos and then try to make, you know, 10 versions of hooks for each of the videos to see which one works best. No, find a winning video. And then test 10 hooks on the winning video. Like step one is get a working video, which you did right. on your CPM test. And now run those hooks and test, you know, 10, 15 hooks. And I hear these stories all the time. If I remember correctly, there's a company called like uh, Mini Katana and they supposedly like make 30 hooks for every video, but they only are gonna make 30 hooks when they have a video that's working so well that it's worth posting 10 more times, right? That's the only that's reason. Right, yeah. so, so getting that hook is what's gonna engage that user a little bit more, increase your CTR and get the user to click more often. So now we've done CPM and CPC. So now the third one, conversion rate, is a much larger topic when it comes to landing pages overall, right? Right. So of we've course. now gotten the user off of the platform and onto our landing page. And so the first piece of data I want to see, which is much harder to get than it used to be, thanks to all of the uh, tracking changes over the years. But the number I want to know is what is the time on site for this user? How long is a person spending actually looking at my landing page? And this is going to tell me a lot because if the average time on site is eight seconds, then I know the users are totally irrelevant. Like they're just not staying on long enough for them to be interested to read anything I have to say. If the time on site is 73 hours, I also know something is wrong because why are they taking so long to make a decision? So I want to know approximately what this time on site is so that I can come in and say, is it good or bad? So the first thing I want to define is how long should I expect the user to spend on my site? And to do that, I need to go and spend some time on my site. What I like to do is I like to get, like first I like to go on, my, on the landing page. And I like to scroll through it and I just see like approximately how long does it take me to get through everything on this landing page? <clears throat> and so there might be a video on there. There might be some text to read. There might be some drop downs, whatever that is. Go through the page and just experience it and see like how long did it take me to see all this stuff? So let's say it was two minutes. So it took me two minutes. So that means that a super engaged, highly interested person will have to spend two minutes just to read all the content on this landing page. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to see, like, is that what the average person does? So I'm going to go to a few people, preferably ones that fall into my category of people that are interested and say, like, can you go to this landing page? And I'm just going to, like, watch over your shoulder as you do it. And I'm going to also time you to see 
what you're, you know, how long you're on that page for and just to see how users are engaging. And you might find they also spend about two minutes to watch, to, you know, to engage with the page. So what that gives me is the metric that I want, which is like the holy grail of potential opportunity is if every single person was super engaged, it's been two minutes, but I'm not expecting every single person from a Facebook ad to be super engaged. I'm expecting half of those people to be super engaged. So what I'm looking for is whatever that number is that it, the average time on page, I want it to be 50% of that number. The closer to 50% to that number, the better. So if is that the average people, is the average 50%, the average is not 50%, but it gives me a place to work, right? Like you, you imagine if I'm sending people to a, 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 a page that all there is to do is give me your email address and leave. Like I'm going to give you three reasons to give you my page. It takes you eight seconds to read the page. There's nothing else to do. There's no video. There's no reviews. There's nothing. Give me your email. You either are on it or not. So that's, that's going to be a much higher, potentially a much higher conversion. I've seen pages like that, that convert at like 70, 80% versus someone trying to sell you a $7,000 couch. All of a sudden, yeah, you're you, the minute I see a price tag, I'm like, I'm jumping ship. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not there. Right. You're not going to get 50%. If you're lucky, you're getting a 1%, right? Like if you're lucky at that, that, that price tag, and you imagine the same thing's true with like long sales pages, how long, you know, are people reading 11 minutes of text? Probably not. So what I'm looking for is I want to know that about I'm, I'm hitting somewhere in the range about 50% of that right, total right. time it takes to engage with the video. Like you, let's just say I have a six minute video on my landing page and the average time on site is a minute. It means no one's watching my video. People are not Do engaging remember, long enough to watch the video. You remember there was that time where I, I don't, I don't even know if it still works, but there's a time where people would have these 40 minute long, non pausable videos. Oh yeah. Still available. Is that still going on? Still going on. <laughs> and oh then only God. at minute 37, all of a sudden a button appears on the bottom for you to click to the next step. Gotta love it. It's uh, it's a wild world out there. It is a wild world. All right, so, Ezra, we only, we're, we're at 43 minutes. So I do want to, if we can, uh, we've well, I just have to covered a lot last of two points and then we're done with this whole. All right, well then thing. I have a very important question. So let's go through these last two points. Okay. Two points. So now I, I want to know that my users are spending time on my landing page appropriately for how long they should be spending on the landing page. If they're not, there's only two reasons. One is I got the wrong people to my landing page. Two, I did a very bad job explaining why the people are there. So if I did the right testing at the CPM and CPC step where I tested all the right audiences and consolidated appropriately. So the, that reason should not exist when I actually get the user to the landing page. Like they, they should be the right type of person. So if I didn't do that, now is the time to maybe test other users. So in this, what I would do here, if I'm seeing this issue is I would go after my warmest users and just send them to the page. The same way I would tell you, like, look over the shoulder of some friend and watch them use it. That's what I want you to do. I want you to go after like, your previous purchasers, your, your email subscribers, spend 30 bucks, send a bunch of people to the page and see how long they spend on the page. You'd imagine your warm users will engage a lot more interesting. And you want to see like how, how long are they going to click and engage with the page? So that's number one. Number two is you want to, you want them to know why they're here. So it used to be this big thing, which doesn't exist as much anymore, where a person would have this ad and would say like free cruise, click for more. And then you get to a landing page, it would be like about something totally different. And on the bottom, there'd be like some information about the cruise. You're like hiding like the secret information on the bottom that they actually click for, but you got there for the wrong reason. And so people used to do this, like buy my Facebook ad course and you get to the page that sells like a Google ad course. Like it's a totally different thing. So what I want to do is I want to be able to, to show as early on as possible on the landing page that they got here because of that thing. Like they saw that ad that was relevant to them, that they got them to click. And then as much of the stuff going on on that ad can also be on my landing page, whether the video is similar to the character, you know, the actors in the videos look the same, the headlines match up between the two. And mm -hmm. so now the person got there and understands why they're spending time on your landing page. So that's the lever It's to get the, to give the user clear understanding about why they're spending time on the page. So now that they're actually spending enough time on the page, the very last thing to look at is, are they converting, right? They, they've done this job of actually taking the time to read all the content. What is stopping them from buying? And here again, there are only two levers to pull. Either the offer's no good, right? Like if I targeted the, if I did all of the stages we just talked about, I got the right people onto my ad, they're engaged and interested, they're watching my video, they come to my website. 
They click for a price that's normal and their click through rate's high. And they actually engage with the appropriate amount of time that watch that video and read all the comments on the page. The only reason they wouldn't buy at this time is because the thing you're offering them is not the thing they want. And so at this stage, what I want to do is test different offers. So that might be I'm selling a bicycle. And now do I give a percentage off the bicycle? Do I give a gift card? Do I give a bonus? Buy one, get one free. Do I give free shipping? Like what is the mechanism that gets me to get that offer off the ground? Like what is that? What is that mechanism that gets the user to actually take the action? And this is where most businesses just go after like, give them 20% off and get them to buy, right? Like, right. and that's not, obviously it's not the best way to achieve my high um, average car value, but it is, it's a great way to lower my CPA because I'm just right. basically offering people, just take it off my hands for free, why don't you? Um, right. And and maybe that will do the job that will, you know, whatever. But it's, it, that, that is not the best way to do it. The best way to do it is understand how to give these users the product they actually want by explaining in the product, you know, on the landing page, all the reasons why this is the thing they want and get them to take that action. And obviously the less money you can give away, the better and uh, great. So that's number one. And number two is, is not as true on e-commerce sites, but it's definitely true on many other landing pages. And we just spoke about it because you brought it up, which is those landing pages that have videos that you can't do anything for 43 minutes until you watched all the video. It's maybe you just are making your users jump through hurdles they don't want to jump through. And so there used to be this landing page. I don't know if you've ever experienced this on HubSpot. HubSpot used to do this thing where they would have these ads for this ebook or something. And you come to the landing page to get the ebook for free. And they would ask you like 173 yes. questions. Yes, yes. And it was just like this, this super weird transition from like, I just want your ebook about, you know, 10 headlines that work in email opens. And you're asking me for like a thousand things about my company and, and who the, you know, like the, my dog's name and, and all this stuff that I don't want to give answers to. And so by asking all of these questions, you're actively deterring users from giving information. And that's exactly what HubSpot wanted. Meaning the whole point of that long thing was they, they knew that the only people that'd be filling this format are like super engaged, interested people. Sure, but sure, sure. But what you're doing by asking more questions is keeping users away from buying. So if you have a landing page and you just want an email, but you ask for first name, last name, email, phone number, you know, date of birth, you're losing out on huge numbers of people that would have just given your email if you would have just asked. So it's understanding what information do I actively need here to give this user the experience that they want. And so the reason why I said that for e-commerce, it doesn't exist as much is because most users, most businesses today are using Shopify. The prop, you know, the, pl the platform is pretty straightforward. Once you purchase using ShopPay once, it saves your credit card, it saves your address. You have to put that information a thousand times. They understand why they have to give their phone number in case the product gets lost. They want to be able to call you and tell you that the product's lost or that, you know, when the delivery is happening. So for e-commerce brands, most of that work is worked out on Shopify already as a yeah. platform. But even still, there are, you know, there are Shopify plugins that allow you to tweak the, 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 the checkout experience and potentially having additional buying options besides shop pay and having Alibaba and having, uh, you know, WeChat pay and having uh, PayPal and all these different options potentially will allow the user to check out more easily. But it's exactly that experience that I question, is there something deterring the user from buying? Maybe I don't have to ask this question that'll get that user to buy. And that in the end of the day is all of the levers that you can move for each stage along the way, look at the data and say, is this high or low? Is my CPM high? Great, what can I do right now? Here are my options. Oh, my, 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 my page on, you know, my time on page is very low. What can I do right now to actively change Amazing. that thing? So that is basically all of the levers that can actively be used to affect my CPA. Now you had one big question that we want to answer and then hopefully we'll wrap up. This is, has gone on for quite some time. 50 minutes, but, but I know everyone, but it's very valuable. Notes. I mean, you've given people the full picture and that's, what's, what's important here. And sometimes I even imagine even seasoned pros are sometimes forgetting one of those levers. They're just not paying attention to it. I've seen yeah. it and for I've sure. only been doing this for three and a half months. So it's, it's, it's interesting to see that, uh, that this stuff is still very valuable, even to the most seasoned of professionals. Now, here's a question. Can you give me just one story throughout your career? where one of those levers were seriously lacking where, and you were able to tell your client or you were able to do for your client, hey, do X, Y, and Z, and you saw significant lowered CPAs. Almost every one of the experiences I've had for every client is me fixing something in that funnel 
that allowed them to get dramatically better results. Like the whole reason, I would say, in a nutshell, the reason to hire an ad buyer is to improve on those stages. I have come to businesses and I've seen they're spending a huge amount of money on link click ads. And I said to them, what are you doing? If we just ran the same ad to the, to the same targeting, to the same landing page, but we optimize for conversion, what do you think would happen? And we, we made that one change and they went from losing money to making money, like literally instantaneously. I came to a client and I said, we were running ads and the video is engaging, but it's not getting engagement. Something's obviously off. What if we just change the targeting of the users with the very same content? And we went from having a click-through rate of a 0.8 to a 2.8. Just this, we're talking about like just two weeks ago. This is happening every day. This is, this is literally the job of an ad buyer is looking at all of these pieces and looking at each one and dissecting, okay, I ran these ads or the client. Just last night, I was look, I'm reviewing an ad account and I was looking at it and saying, which of the levers can we use to improve the performance of this account? Is it the targeting? Is it the objective? Is it the landing page? Is it the, 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 con, you know, the content? Is it the persuasiveness of the text? Is it the landing page itself? And uh, you've watched a lot of reviews uh, that are uh, ad account audits. That's literally what an ad account audit is, is looking at each of these stages reviewing those four metrics, the CPM, the CPC, the time on site, and the conversion rate, and saying what is right and what is wrong here, and fixing those metrics. So you want one specific example. I met a company, they had spent quite a lot of money on marketing, both on and off Facebook, to advertise for their in-person location-based um, experience for children. So like, you go to the store and you, you know, there's one, there's a lot of these stores um, throughout malls in America. Malls in America are like basically dying. Um, so most of the stores there don't want to sell product. They want to sell experiences. So you go there. I'm sure if you've been in America, there's a ton of these. But like even Build-A-Bear has created an experience that's an experience that you get a product from, right? It's about coming in, getting the thing you can't just get from ordering a doll on the internet. And you get to like pick the product and fill up the, you know, the stuff yourself and give the heart a kiss and all that stuff. That's part of the experience. So this same thing, we wanted to get users, it wasn't Build-A-Bear, although Build-A-Bear, uh, we should call. Um, we should have a chat. If they're still in business, I'm not even sure. Um, <laughs> but they came to me and they said, you know, we spent $150,000. We've made almost no money. What could we do to, to get, you know, people in our doors? We opened in three days. So I came in, I took over. And in literally, it was 90 hours from when I started to when we went from a 0.8 time return to a three and a half time return on ad spend. And what we changed was exactly this. We took videos, video content that they had to show off the product. Now the store hadn't opened yet, so there was no content of users using it. But what they did was they had some influencers come in before and they took this content. We targeted, we were super hyper-focused for the first you know, couple of days just on the five, 10 mile radius of the store, like as you, more users would learn about it and as we would run ads for longer, we would expand out to 30, 50 miles. But for the first day or two, who's coming? The people that are coming are, you know, 10, 15 minutes away. So we focused all of the ad spend on, on uh, the, that 10 mile radius. We shifted all ad spend from landing page and engagement ads to purchase events, which that the previous agency did not do. And, we tweaked the, the landing page so that instead of, instead of originally they had for this event, they had a uh, specific day tickets. They had a higher price any day ticket. And I said, let's, I'd rather sell the any day ticket. It gives the user, you know, that flexibility to say, I can't come on Friday, but I, come, I can come on Saturday. I don't have to pick the exact time I want to come. And so it, essentially we were selling a slightly higher product, but the reason wasn't for that. It wasn't for an AOV play. It was just because the convenience of the user um, and we shifted the ad spend to a landing, the same landing page, but just auto select, you know, any day ticket rather than specific day ticket, which allowed the user to skip a few steps that required them to go through a calendar where they have to pick a date and a time and all that stuff. And it improved the conversion rate on the landing page. So we essentially went from what the last agency was doing, which was broader targeting, lower quality impressions from link clicks and video views. The, the, the content wasn't as powerful content, which they had available. It's not like, it's not like all of a sudden they made it for me. No, they had that content available. I just chose higher quality content in that moment. And the landing page was pre-selected to be the 
simplest experience, like the same thing we said, the jumping through hoops of the user that we eliminated by choosing the any day ticket over the specific day ticket. And quite literally overnight in 90 hours, like we're talking about between three and four days time, we went from them losing money every day for the last four weeks to making over a three times return. In the end, in the one, the first month of activity, we made over $200,000 together from in profit. Like we're talking about on top of the cost of the ad spend and me, we generated an additional $200,000 in profit in the business from those ads, which until, until I was working with them, they had lost over $100,000 in fees from the agency before. Wow. Wow. I mean, it's very significant. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the pod, and we hope you enjoyed this topic. There is always something to be that can be done on the Facebook side of things, the Facebook ad side of things to lower your CPA. It is doable. You just have to believe it. And do and the, hire the right ad buyer. <laughs> with the right guy, with the right person behind the scenes, you will be making more profit. That is just what's needed. Everyone, please like and subscribe. Send your questions, your topics. And we're going to keep doing more of these things. So just stay tuned. You are, we're here for you. We are, we're here for you even in times when you're not here for yourself. Kevin O'Leary, full circle. All right, goodbye everyone. Till the next time. See ya.